Good morning. So tell me, did every one of you make it till midnight on New Year's Eve? You did, Sydney? I'm not surprised. Did you? Maybe. Maybe? No. No? Yeah. Yep. No? How about you, Addie? Did you make it till midnight? No? About. Did you? About. About? Exactly. Okay, so all of you know what a New Year's resolution is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me what it is. <laughs> me? Uh huh. Somebody. Um, to pray more, I guess. Mm -hmm. Try to do something different for the new year. Okay, that's mm -hmm. pretty good. Do you, like have a goal so like and like some people might have a new year resolution to lose weight or to eat healthier or something like that it's like a goal it's a promise that you make that says you're going to try to do some things better isn't it so what year are we in now 2013 2013 and what happened to 2012 uh, it's gone, baby, gone, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> okay. Uh, most people don't keep the promises they make to do better, do they? I want you to tell me what you promised to do better this year, okay? You want to tell me what you promised to do better this year? Um, you didn't make a resolution this year? How about Addie? Um, to try to make everything happy and to enjoy everything that you have. Wonderful. I don't know if you all heard what he said, but it was to make everything happy and enjoy everything that you have. <coughs> Put joy in your friends. Okay. How about you? <laughs> Are you a little shy today? No. <laughs> try to eat healthier and because I'm a picky one. Oh, what don't you like? Everything? Pretty much. <laughs> so what are you going to... What? Oh, hey, we need to eat more than candy. What vegetable did you decide you were going to try really, really hard to like this year? Maybe no vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Ben? What are you going to do better this year? <laughs> I don't know. How about you? Catch colds more often? Oh, that's a great thing. Try not to catch colds so often. That would be a wonderful thing to promise ourselves. Okay, most people don't keep their resolutions because they don't know the secret. There's a secret to keeping a New Year's resolution. Would you like to know the secret? Okay. Um, it's right here in the Bible in Proverbs 16.3. It says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. In other words, whatever we start to do, if we're doing it to please God, we have a much better chance of finishing it. That's a good secret to know, isn't it? Okay, let's all pray. And we don't have to do a repeat prayer today. We'll just pray, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a whole new year in which to worship you. Please help us to try and please you in everything we do. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, you guys can go to Sunday school. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. This is morning from First uh, Corinthians. Greeting from Paul, called by God's will to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and from Sothenes, our brother, to God's church that is in Corinth, to those who have been made holy to God in Christ Jesus, who are called to be God's people, together with all those who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in every place. He's their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving for the Corinthians. I thank my God always for you because of God's grace that was given to you in Christ Jesus. That is, you were made rich through him in everything, in all your communication and every kind of knowledge. 
in the same way that the testimony from Christ was confirmed with you. The result is that you aren't missing any spiritual gift while you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also confirm your testimony about Christ until the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and you were called by him to partnership with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I have way too much stuff here. So if you'll bear with me just a second. I meant to say a few, couple of things during announcements that I uh, overlooked, so I will bring them up at this point uh, right now. Hopefully that won't fall. First of all, if you need one of these bags, let me know. Uh, if it's close to you, uh, just go ahead and grab one. But if you don't have one... Let me know, we do have a couple of extras. You may wonder what this is, and, you know, I've never really delivered a message before where I've uh, been kind of required to uh, pass out barf bags before the message. So you need a bag back there? Okay. <laughs> Take it me seriously. These are not waterproof, so it will come through the paper. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I uh, really have a major, major complaint to file, and I just don't know who to go to. I mean, it's really, really bothering me. Did you know that we live in a, a time of deception? That people are actually out there trying to deceive us in any way possible, any way that you can imagine. I have noticed that a size 36-inch waist does not fit anymore because they're mislabeling the pants. That's a real problem. I think it's false advertising. They say 36. Clearly it's not 36. So speaking of New Year's resolutions, I'm going to show you here how we can all enjoy some New Year's resolutions, particularly those of losing some weight. Anyway, you may not have heard of this guy, probably didn't hear of this guy. His name is Li Fuyan. And Li Fuyan lives just outside of Beijing in a small little village. Li is an interesting character because for a period of about four years, Li suffered incredible pain. I mean, he had headaches so bad that he could not sleep. He couldn't function for four years years his head bothered him that much and then all of a sudden his ear was on the right side his ear started to bother him he went to every kind of specialist that you can imagine in china to try to get some relief to figure out what the cause of this pain was so for four years he struggled he went to chiropractors he went to uh, acupuncture specialists he went to medical he Anything you could imagine. So many doctors looked at him that he completely forgot how many there were. Four years of suffering pain. Now, when you see what caused that pain in Lee, probably the first thing you're going to say, I wonder how in the heck did he stay alive? A ca the cause of his pain should have been fatal. But nobody knew what, what it was during these four years. Although his condition was rare, it's amazing how, uncom or how common it actually occurs. Although Lee had a very rare condition, it's out there a lot. Many people suffer from it. We see it happening sometimes due to some kind of an accident. We see it happening sometimes uh, when uh, people that really should know better cause it. You would think that you trust this per particular pe person or group of people. You trust them enough to say, well, that's not going to happen to me. But it's very common. It's amazing how it is. When it happens by people who know better to you, there's a name for it. And I didn't make this up, but the name is gossip pibobum, piboma. 
if I can pronounce it correctly. Any medical people here, Kelly? That uh, Gossip paboma is a condition caused by people who know better. And it's serious. It happens a lot. We'll get to in some of the statistics in a minute. Because the morbidity rate is so high when things like this happen, having an early diagnosis is critical. Because if you don't have that early diagnosis, you're going to die. It's fatal. It's just amazing. Let me explain this just a little bit further. Bonnie and I recently have been watching uh, a relatively new uh, TV program. And the TV program is on the Animal Planet Network. You guys know what Animal Planet is? It got the great puppies and all that good stuff. Yeah, good. This program is called The Monsters Inside Me. Anybody see it? A couple of them? Yeah? The Monsters Inside of Me. Whoa. Yeah, it's everything you think it's going to be. It's kind of a scary thing. This gentleman right here is from one episode. We're going to watch a short clip as to what his monsters were. Michael? A retiree is driven to the brink of insanity by a host of hungry critters. If this rash continues, it would just absolutely drive me nuts. Sixty-eight-year-old Edwin Curtis is being pushed to the brink of insanity by an unrelenting itch. The itching is driving me crazy. All I can think of is, I got to get better. This is absolutely ridiculous. Dr. Howard Luber is a specialist in internal medicine and dermatology in Phoenix. Edwin presents to me with a widespread rash. He has itchy, red, scaly bumps everywhere but his face. Dr. Luber takes a skin sample from one of Ed's inflamed red welts. I decide to do a skin biopsy to try to get some clues as to why his condition is not going away. The piece of skin goes to a laboratory to be tested. The doctor called us and I happened to answer the phone. I called Ed and he got on the phone. I'm sitting on pins and needles waiting to hear what the doctor has to say. So the test results come back and it's clear now that we have an answer as to what's causing Edwin's rash. Edwin has a parasitic disease called scabies. Neither one of us had a clue what it was. I immediately think of something that's eating away at a dead body. It, it sounds very frightening. Scabies is caused by an infestation of the skin by the human itch mite, Sarcoptes scabii. This microscopic parasite literally eats your skin. If my skin wasn't already itching, the thought of a parasite crawling under my skin would cause me to start itching. Adult mites will often seek out a new host. They do this by hitching a ride on sheets, linens, or through skin-to-skin -skin contact. This means that any place where people are in close quarters can be a potential source of infection. I had been in the hospital for five days, and uh, after I went to a rehab center, either one of those places could have been where the scabies came from. Monsters Inside Me. Only on Animal Planet. So, have you ever thought about that? <laughs> yeah. Monsters Inside of Me. Believe me, there's some other episodes that really weren't appropriate, even though you have barf bags, really weren't appropriate to show here. I mean, we're talking bot flies out of the sc scalp and other creepy crawler things inside from tapeworms to hookworms, you name it. Anyway, the entire show tells stories about how people deal with monsters inside of them. So something inside of us, monsters inside of us, 
What does our body do when we have some kind of a foreign invasion? We have something that really doesn't belong in our body. What does our body tend to do? We tend to send to that body antibodies. We tend to send to that invader antibodies to, to attack what comes inside of us. Clearly, God is saying, I'm going to create people that have an immune system so they can go after something if it is not supposed to be there. And we try. Our, system, our body does what it can. But oftentimes, it can't do enough. Oftentimes, sending those antibodies there cannot cure our problem. Our body is not made nor meant to have these foreign objects in it. Neither is our soul. Our souls do not like foreign objects, just as our bodies do not like foreign objects. Foreign objects for our soul comes in the form of hate, jealousy, revenge, continuing anger, and this is a big one. This one's huge. We all have it. Guilt. Guilt and all these other foreign objects invading our soul does not belong. God does not want us to carry those. So what about Lee? What happened to our friend Lee? After his doctor diagnosed what he had, he went into surgery. And during that surgery process, they removed from his brain a four-inch knife blade. Lee had no idea where that came from. But this is a four-inch knife blade that went right in, you can see why he had earaches, right into his brain. And for four years, that knife blade stayed in there. And finally, the doctor took the x-ray and, and found it while it was there. He only remembers that four years ago, he was mugged, and he was knocked out, and he, had, and he had a little scratch. He had no idea that that blade was inside of him. Now, you have to understand, the body tried to do something over those four years. Look how it ate away at the blade. It actually was beginning to corrode inside of his brain. So the body was trying to get rid of it. Earlier, I mentioned that his condition, although shocking, was not uncommon. In fact, one of Lee's countrymen had a pair of scissors removed from his esophagus two years ago. And by the way, Lee's knife was taken out in September of 2011. So two years ago, one of his friends had scissors stuck in his esophagus. On, in April of 2009, a Colorado man coughed up a nail that had been stuck in his nose for 30 years. How do you get a, no a nail in there? And then how do you not know it's there for 30 years? Also in 2009, a two-year-old Brazilian boy was found living with 50 sewing needles put into his body, all over his body. And here's a picture, this next slide, of someone who swallowed a spoon. How do you swallow a spoon? Foreign objects. Or how about this two-inch nail in this next slide that was found inside of a construction worker, lies in his brain. Probably came out of one of those air guns. Now, this one's really cool. I love this one. Here is a uh, snapshot of a six-year-old who loved Toy Story so much that she swallowed Buzz Lightyear. How do you swallow a toy like Buzz Lightyear? Here's someone that actually ate 350 coins lodged in his body. 350 coins. Most of these people said, I don't feel so good. So I better go to the doctor. Yeah, go figure. All right. Here's a guy who ate a lot of kitchen utensils. You can see spoons and other items in here. In fact, everything's in there practically except the sink, the infamous kitchen sink. He couldn't get in. 
Here's an 18-year-old that ate 42, count them, magnets. The interesting thing about this, after eating 42 magnets, as you know, magnets attract one another or they repel. The kid says, oh, I feel funny. He actually said, I think there's a mouse inside of me searching for food with all these magnets moving around. Now, this next one is absolutely my favorite. This is an 18-year-old girl who is in surgery right now. And they're removing this item. Look at, look at the size of this. See the doctor's hands and everything? You can get an idea of the size. Anybody know what that is? Get your barf bags ready. <laughs> That's a hairball. Every time she was ner- 18 years old, every time she was anxious or nervous, she ate her own hair. And it got lodged in her intestines. You know, she decided that it was important to go to the doctor because first she had a stomach ache, but secondly, she lost 55 pounds. Now, there's a diet that I could go on, and we could lose weight that way, right? If you've got enough hair, Scott, you'll fit right in there. <laughs> now, these mistakes are actually accidental or maybe uh, on purpose when you have a youngster that, uh, that swallows magnets. But gossip abodum is an extremely critical, na- dangerous condition that people can be in because something happened by people who know better that shouldn't have done it. Now, it's quite common, more common than you think, and I'm sure you've heard about it, but more common than you think, some doctors during surgery will accidentally leave things behind inside the patient. Everything from, oh, here's some scissors that was left inside of a patient who had lung surgery. We've got another pair of scissors here that looks like it's kind of down towards the leg area. That's inside the body. They leave sponges. They leave towels. Here is what they call uh, uh, something you put in to pull your chest apart. They leave these things inside patients. And do you know statistically... First of all, they can't determine exactly how because doctors really try to cover it up. (laughs) But statistically, they believe it happens in 10% of all surgeries. If you have surgery and you're one in 10 people, something like this could happen. Gossip piboma. Amazing. And what happens when these things are inside the body is the body rejects it. The people become quite uncomfortable. They think, well, I should be better now after a minor surgery, but they're not. They feel pain. So they go back in and they look and they see these foreign objects inside the body. God never intended for us to have any foreign objects inside of our bodies. As you know, when something does occur, our immune system comes in. But what do we have for our souls? What kind of immune system do we have for our souls? We carry the weight of these invaders with us every day. It drags us down. It keeps us from a relationship either with someone else or with the Holy Spirit. When we carry hatred, when we carry a grudge, those things are invading our souls And they keep us from that relationship that we can have. So, what kind of things, if we had an x-ray of your soul, what kind of things would we find? Would we find remorse? Would we find guilt? What would we find? Many of the foreign objects uh, that we carry are in there. No matter what the cause of your pain or how big it is, God wants to remove it. And guess what? He can. He can remove it. Let's take a look at guilt, for example. We're not talking about necessarily wimpy guilt, like maybe you cheated on a diet or something like that. We're talking about heavy stuff. Maybe you've hurt somebody. Maybe you feel guilty about some behavior that you did. 
We have a tough time shaking guilt. We have a tough time shaking shame. But you know what? God does not want us to do that. But unlike the bugs and unlike the surgical equipment that might be in our bodies, doctors can't come in and remove all that stuff from you. Wouldn't it be nice, though, go into surgery, hey, while you're in there, doc, take out my hate. While you're in there, doc, take out my guilt. Take out my fear. Wouldn't that be great if we could do that? Point is, we don't have to do that. We can ask God to do it for us. And how do we know that? We know that because we are aware of God's grace. We know that God is pouring grace all over us as long as we keep that in mind. It's easy for us to forget God's grace. God's grace is abundant. We forget it because quite often we feel we don't deserve it. You're right. You don't deserve it. But that's what makes it grace. is because God gives it to you abundantly everywhere you turn. God does not want you to carry this around for two reasons. One, it gets in the way of a relationship with Him. And two, God has this overwhelming desire for you to have peace. Overwhelming desire for you to to have peace. Wow. That abundant grace flows everywhere. Grace is a gift from God. And this gift came to us, and grace was revealed only through Jesus Christ. God revealed His love and His grace for us at the birth of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what life was like before Christ? The guilt, the burdens that everyone carried, they could never run away, they could never be happy, they could never find solitude, they could never live and have peace. But we have that advantage because God revealed His grace to us through grace. Grace is this huge cloud that is out there for us, that we're walking through, that is for us to have and for us to enjoy and recognize because we don't deserve it. And that's what makes it grace. Sometimes people will say, I deserve grace. Well, if you say that, then you've just wiped it out because you, don't, you can't say that. You don't get grace because you think you deserve it. It's there anyway. Be like if you were planning your own birthday surprise party. If you did that, you wouldn't be surprised. So it takes away the surprise part. You don't deserve grace, but God gives it to you. Now here lies the struggle, and it's a struggle for grace. It reminds us that grace is bigger than everything else that God offers us. It's greater than His compassion for us. It's greater than His forgiveness. Grace covers everything, and it covers all the tasks that we do and we have. When God pours His grace on us, guess what? He expects us to do the same with others. So as God forgives us because of the grace, we're to forgive others and not carry that grudge or that burden around. When grace is correctly supplied, it can solve everything in your life, every single thing, when you recognize and surrender your life to God and see His grace for you. The other part about grace, it's kind of like a Christmas present. Picture a tree in your home and a huge wrapped box with this beautiful red bow that's on it. And guess what else is on the package? It's got your name on it. And so you feel like, I'm not going to go and open that right away. I'll I'll just wait a little bit. And then all of a sudden through time you're going, man, I, I guess I forgot about that. I forgot to open that box. You don't have the grace. The grace that's in the box, you not only have to be aware of it, all you have to do is accept it, is to say, yes, God, thank you. I know your grace is here within me. I accept it. That present under the tree doesn't mean anything to you if you don't open it up and take it. It's just a nice bow under a tree. One of the things that we can do to relieve ourselves of 
the burden of carrying these things. It's not an easy thing to do, but neither is forgiveness. It's the ability to forget. We know that memory is a wonderful gift. I know a few people that actually have a photographic memory. I worked for one one time. It's incredible. He could, he could come back with anything that happened in his 55 at that time, years of life. Anything, everything he saw, he remembered. A beautiful, fantastic photographic memory. Now, we all don't have that. Sometimes we wish we did, but we don't have that. You need to know that I have a very good memory. It's just a little bit short, but it's good. Now, as good as a memory may be, there's also a huge benefit in the ability to forget. And I, I sometimes will do that. I'll stand up to speak and my mind sits back down. I forget what I'm going to say. I get tongue-tied. But the ability to forget, intentionally forget, helps us. We can say, I distinctly remember forgetting that you hurt me. It's very clear to me that I remember the time when I forgot you, when I forgot how you hurt very important. We see in Scripture that the importance of forgetting. Paul tells us in Philippians, he says, forgetting what lies behind, I press on. So you don't let that past pull you back. You don't let that past of grudges and, and pain pull you down. You forget that and you move on. We need to forget past hurts. Those kinds of things dampen our spirits and drain away our energy and eat our soul. Just like those mites were eating at the skin, those things eat your soul away. And they stand in the way of that relationship that you can have with God. We all have monsters inside of us. We need to, that we need to do what we can so that they don't set up a permanent shop. And the way to do that is to just recognize and live in God's grace. And the way to do that is to offer grace to others. If you're having difficulty forgiving, if you have uh, a great difficulty because someone has hurt you so bad or disappointed you, that may be a spiritual red flag. It may be something that you really need to take a look at because it's a flag that says, whoa, if I'm carrying this, I don't have that complete indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It blocks that relationship. Now, when we talk about having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, I am not talking at all about a commitment to God. I don't want you folks to say, I am committed to God. I'm committed to the Trinity. I'm committing my life to the Holy Spirit. That's not what we're asking for. There's a difference between commitment and surrender. And to make this point, if you look at a breakfast here of ham and eggs, who had the most commitment? The chicken or the pig? Yes. The pig, you're right. (laughs) The chicken continues to give them the eggs, but the pig made a total surrender. That's what I'm talking about. It's not a commitment to God. It's a surrendering of your life. If you remember anything from this message today, I ask you to remember that it's not at all about what you've done, the guilt that you're carrying. It's not at all about who you are. It's not at all about you, period. It's not about you. It's not about your heart and your soul or what you've done. The important thing to remember is what has been done for you. What has been done for you when God decided to reveal to the world His grace. How important that is. You have to remember it's not about you. It's about what God revealed to you.
When we live in complete surrender, when we give our lives to Christ and live in that realm of that perfect indwelling of the Holy Spirit, when the passion that you have in life matches what you do in life, when the passion that is important to you matches your activities, you're in a special zone. You're in a place that we call the sweet spot. Now, if anybody's ever hit a baseball with a baseball bat, you know what the sweet spot is. A sweet spot is that place on the bat when you swing and hit that ball, you don't even feel it. But that ball goes on forever. That's called living in the sweet spot. Every athletic piece of equipment that has a ball involved has a sweet spot. Every one. And our goal is to live in your sweet spot. Have your passion matching your activities. Increasing your life with measurable grace does a number of things in your life. One of the things you realize when so much is given to you, when all the blessings that God has for you each and every moment that you appreciate, that you open your heart and you surrender to God and you feel all that, those things and the Holy Spirit indwells, what happens is that you are offering the same thing to others. You increase your giving. You increase your generosity to other lives. Now that we are entering our January sermon series on how we can show God how much we appreciate Him. We're not going to talk about tithing. We're not going to talk about church budgets. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with your relationship with God and what He wants you to do. Recognizing God's gifts. I read a story about a couple that sat down for quite a while. In fact, it took a week. Every time they had an opportunity, they sat back down. And they wrote down on a piece of paper in just seven days all the things that they believe that God has blessed them with. At last count, it was well over 2,000 of all the things that God has blessed you with. Recognizing God's gifts and blessings helps us to remain humble servants. As a child of God, we are responsible to exercise the gifts that He gives us for the benefit of others. That's our job. God has given each and every one of you special gifts. And it's our responsibility to use those gifts. It's our responsibility to take those gifts and live in our sweet spot. When everything that we do matches our passion, that is joy, that's serenity. That's an incredible level to be at every day. And it's attainable. We need to take a look at our obligation to the body of Christ. As Paul has said, we're not a church. Don't think of us, don't think of the ark as a church. We are the body of Christ. What's God calling us to do to strengthen that body? What kind of exercises can we do that will give stamina to our body of Christ? What can we do to reach out in the community with acts of random kindness and help people that need help? What can we do to be the heart of this community as the body of Christ and reach out to folks? I know we can do it. I'm confident we can do it. I've prayed about it many times, and I see it happening. But we need to take a look at what exactly is our commitment. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the last Sunday in January, we've got Jeff Pospisil to come in from the Dakotas Conference. And he's going to speak to us that day about the body of Christ and how important it is to maintain that commitment. You'll like it. You'll enjoy him. He's a great speaker. You don't want to miss the 27th of January. Our mission is to fulfill the requirements of the body of Christ 
Our mission is to reach out into the community and help those people that just don't know yet that God loves them. It's simple. They just don't know it yet. All we have to do is show them. And the only way that we can show them is to remove all those foreign objects that are in our souls. Get into that surrender with the Holy Spirit and live with that indwelling and it'll radiate from you. You won't, as Mike said last week, you got, you'll preach the gospel, but if you have to, sometimes you'll use words. But you'll find you won't have to use the words. Your actions will show people the joy that you have living in the body of Christ with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen.